Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jenny Blizzard with Fed Communities. We would like to welcome you to our May Connecting Communities webinar, Two Sides of One Child Care Dilemma. Access to quality early childhood education is critical to the well being of communities and the economy. A lack of access to reliable and affordable child care affects the workforce and child care providers. Today, you'll hear more about these challenges and some innovative solutions and more about Fed research related to this topic. In addition to Fed colleagues, we're honored to have early child care providers and even parents share their perspectives and provide insights on community solutions. But before we get started, we would like to share a few housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded and will be available within two weeks. Views expressed during the session are those of the speakers and are intended for informational purposes. They do not necessarily represent the views of Fed communities or the Federal Reserve System. Microphones have been muted. Please use the Q&A feature throughout the session to submit questions. We promise to get to as many of them as possible. And finally, feel free to keep the conversation going and engage with us on Twitter using the hashtag connecting communities. Before we jump into the content of today's event, I would like to briefly introduce Ben Horowitz, who's going to kick off today's session. Ben is a senior policy analyst at the Minneapolis Fed. He writes about policies and programs impacting affordable housing, investments in low and moderate income communities and early childhood development. So now I turn it over to you, Ben. Take it away. Thanks, Jenny. As Jenny mentioned, I work in community development and engagement at the Minneapolis Fed, one of 12 regional Federal Reserve banks spread across the nation. We're the ninth district, the colored gold swath at the top of the map here. I'm located in the Twin Cities, which is a metro that's home to about three and a half million people. The next largest metros in our district, Duluth and Fargo, each have less than 300,000 people. We've got 12% of the nation's land, but only 3% of its people. So our district is very big and very diverse in just about every way you can imagine. We've got a big metro, we've got native nations, we've got regional hubs surrounded by rural and frontier communities. There are bustling main streets that have been revitalized by immigration, boom towns, and places that are struggling economically. One of our jobs in my department is to understand how low and moderate income households are able to participate in all these local economies. We often ask, what's keeping low and moderate income households on the sidelines? We also ask how the nation's credit and banking infrastructure serve different communities in our district. These questions all tie into our dual mandate from Congress to pursue stable prices and maximum employment, and also into my department's specific function, which derives from the Community Reinvestment Act. 
I wanted to give you all this context because I want you to understand how significant it is when I say that despite the miles and diversity contained within our district and the range of topics we cover in my department, childcare almost always comes up in conversation with local community leaders. You can go ahead and change the slide from the Fed map to the cute kids on slide six. So just as one example, we recently interviewed about 35 workforce professionals in our district about the biggest challenges for their clients that still struggle to find work in this hot labor market. Childcare was mentioned as one of the three biggest barriers for unemployed workers in nearly every single conversation. I've heard about it in some places you wouldn't expect, like a pork processing facility, and just about everywhere else, like chambers of commerce roundtables and meeting spaces at regional banks, tribal colleges, housing developers offices, and hospitals. The pandemic only grew, diversified, and amplified the chorus of voices in our district, talking about the ways parents' childcare challenges can spill over into the economy as a whole. From talking to my colleagues across the Fed system, tracking data, and listening to the news, I know this isn't only, visit, only the case in my neck of the woods. The increased visibility and intensity of childcare challenges led some of us in the Fed to form a cross-system working group on the topic. That working group has put together numerous informational resources on childcare over the years, including this webinar today and new briefs that we hope are helpful to communities that are grappling with early care and education challenges. And I believe those will be posted in the chat and also distributed after the event. So people generally see the way childcare impacts local businesses, but for whatever reason, sometimes people either don't understand or don't always think first of childcare as a business unto itself. Our group put together some of these resources that we hope are helpful on this front. Um, so our new briefs approach the childcare sector in the way people think about most other businesses. What's the supply of childcare and what's the demand for it? What makes these two basic factors unique for childcare businesses? And how might local efforts support either side of that equation? There are a lot of data points that illustrate the childcare challenge from the supply and demand lens. I'm gonna focus on four of them before we dive into what will be some very interesting panel discussions afterwards. So slide seven is all about the funding. When people think of education, they often think of the K-12 system, which is largely financed by the public. Every parent in the nation expects access to a free public education system once their child is old enough. On the other hand, while there are public and nonprofit resources devoted to child care, they are generally smaller than the amount that is spent within the child care economy by parents. That's what this first chart here is about. It drives home the point that the public sector is not really funding the child care sector. Funding for child care is coming from parents' wallets. We go into more detail on one way to compare the levels of the two types of investments in our supply side brief, which includes some state by state breakdowns. Those working parents and guardians drive the demand for child care. And when that demand goes unmet, there are parents and guardians who want to work but can't. Moving on to slide eight, um, this highlights one of the things we know about this group of working caregivers. Before I dive into that, we also know that most parents are working or want to. 94% of fathers are working or looking for work, and two thirds of mothers are in the same boat. Why the gap? While some parents certainly choose to stay at home, there's also a lot of evidence that when childcare challenges a family, a mother is more likely to stay at home, even if they want to be in the workforce. These decisions look different for families when children are at different ages, which is the point this chart emphasizes. Simply put, it shows that parents work less and are paid less for the hours they do work when their children are younger. Part of that is because parents tend to be younger. Though it doesn't always feel like it, for me, our children age at the same rate we do. So by definition, you'll be older when your children are older. And as people get older, they tend to earn more money. But another big part of the equation is the childcare challenges parents face. First, parents need to find childcare that's available when and where we need it. Our brief has information on how availability can be challenged by just-in-time scheduling non-traditional work hours and other factors. If you can find it, childcare can be expensive. Federal childcare subsidies are available to about 15% of the low and moderate income parents eligible under federally suggested guidelines in a typical year. Other programs like Head Start are also unavailable to all eligible families. There are universal pre-K programs out there in some jurisdictions, but they largely serve three and four-year-olds. Everybody else is facing a market where the average parent pays about $11,000 per child per year, according to research by my colleagues at the St. Louis Fed. That works out to about 15% of a median household income. How does the childcare supply respond to this particular type of demand? Providers, providers must find a way to navigate parents' limited incomes. They're working in an industry where the opportunities to innovate are rare. At the end of the day, one person can only care for so many children. And then there's the cost for them of finding and maintaining an appropriate space. And that's just the beginning. 
slide nine shows how central child care wages are to child care expenses. Even though parents often feel like they are paying high tuition rates, providers themselves are operating on a very narrow profit margin in many cases, with low staff wages, high turnovers, and other myriad uh, challenges. Add in the physical and emotional demands of the actual work of child care, and it's little surprise that many child care providers we talked to or surveyed describe difficulties finding staff alongside high levels of stress and burnout. This chart shows that the labor intensive model of child care businesses means that you can't really increase staff wages without also challenging affordability for parents. These issues and other related ones are explored in the supply side brief. Slide 10 is a pitch on why this is important, even if you don't particularly like children. About 20 years ago, economists at the Minneapolis Fed put out a paper on how investments in high quality early childhood education for children who wouldn't otherwise have access to it has a high rate of return for the public. I emphasize for the public here because the benefits of high quality early childhood education don't just accrue to the family that is able to participate in it. The kids who are in stable, supportive, and nurturing environments feel the impacts of that environment well into adulthood. Over the past two decades, the evidence has remained clear. And now we're seeing signs that high quality early childhood development can actually benefit three generations, parents, their children, and their children's children. This chart shows how the children of the now adult preschoolers from one high quality early childhood program are faring relative to some of their peers whose parents did not get access to that program because of capacity limits. So as I mentioned, we have these new briefs out, which should be shared in the chat and will also be shared with everyone who attended or registered today. And in those briefs, you'll find a lot more detail than I was able to discuss today. And you'll also hear a lot more about these issues from some very interesting people very soon as I turn the mic over to Anna for our first panel of the day. Thanks for your attention. Wow, Ben, thank you so much. Um, yeah, this is really wonderful information that you've given me, and I'm so excited to introduce two speakers. Um, panel one's going to include Aaron Barnice, as well as Grace Major. Um, and you can go ahead and take the, the slide down. People can just see, see us now. <laughs> We're just going to have a conversation. Three moms, um, three you know working moms. Aaron is also a student teacher. Uh, and Grace is in, in LA, and Grace um, works for MAC as a workforce development manager, um, also in California, but in San Diego. So they're going to have some really great perspectives to offer to us. I'll give you a little bit of background um, on who I am and why I'm maybe qualified to uh, to moderate this panel. Um, so I've been working at the St. Louis Fed for the past five years, and the past two of them, um, I've been working that same work group that Ben was talking about, the system-wide early care and education work group, and it's true. Uh, no matter who we who we speak to in the community, childcare frequently comes up as uh, either an opportunity or a challenge, right? Like if it's working well, which for some people it is, uh, if they have it and if they can afford it, that's not the most common narrative. Um, but if you have it and can afford it, then yeah, it uh, enables you to be in the workforce to participate, especially as mothers. Um, but if you don't, and we know those those challenges have been ongoing before the pandemic, but were a lot of times made worse by the pandemic, um, then it can be really challenging. It can be frustrating um, to to participate, and you might have to um, not not because of any choice you make, uh, you know, your opportunities are limited. And so wanting to pull back. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron and to Grace and say, would you mind sharing with us your story? Um, each of you just talk about what your families look like, uh, what your workforce looks like and how childcare plays a role in that. Sure, I'll go first. Um, my name is Erin. I live in Los Angeles. Um, I am a wife and mother of two boys, a three and five year old. Um, and our child care journey started with a private um, company uh, for our oldest son um, in 2000. 19. Uh, we sent him to daycare, um, paying out of pocket. Um, and then, you know, we had this uh, global pandemic you might've heard about. Um, and when everything shut down, um, I was pregnant and on maternity leave um, and having a baby. So we went from a family that was out and about in the community to being shut in like many other people were. Um, and when my maternity leave ended, I went back to, um, a job that was no longer available. The company that I was working for didn't survive the pandemic. So I found myself trying to navigate the workforce as well as 
figure out how we were going to take care of these two children. Um, and to some of Ben's points, um, we were making sacrifices and adjustments to our family. Um, I was considering working nights so that we could continue having health care because as an unemployed person, you can't afford to send your children to, to private uh, daycare anymore. Um, and I was fortunate to find a remote work from home position. Um, so I had to navigate that balance of trying to work um, at home and have two small children running around, running circles around me all day long and the needs that come along with that. Um, and uh, I've been doing that for, for a good while now. And as the program started opening back up, um, we qualified for the Head Start program here in Los Angeles. Um, and my oldest son has been in the Head Start program and youngest just graduated out of the early Head Start into the Head Start. Um, and I found myself kind of looking at that program and was offered an opportunity to become um, a member of a teacher training program through the Los Angeles County Office of Education. Um, so I'm on that path right now, still working full time, still doing student hours, still momming, still wifing, still cooking, kind of cleaning. Um, <laughs> that, that's me. Thank you, Erin. And um, yeah, I, I didn't mention it, but I so appreciate both of your time um, as working moms to take what limited time you have, not to shower by yourself in peace, not to do laundry, but to share your stories with us today. So thank you for that. Grace, what about you? So yeah, I'm Grace. I'm from San Diego. I am a mother and a wife as well. I have two and my children's are, my child is, um, John is seven and Jasmine is 10. And so they're a little bit older, but our childcare journey started since they were uh, born because I have always been in the workforce and um, I have different seasons of childcare um, in my life because I was married to a military um, uh, member. And so that looked different, right? There was assistance, but it was um, not always accepted at all private child care providers. And there was a point where we had to make decisions if it even made sense for me to work because we brought in two incomes. But when you think of the cost of child care, so that was our journey through private sector. And um, we used babysitters because it was more affordable, even though that didn't feel always the, like the best option for the not so much the safety of our children, but for the development of our, you know, our, our child and what we wanted for them when we think of early care and education. Um, I did apply for Head Start and there was a wait list. And so I had, you know, had to wait for that. And then at the time, um, we were two working individuals, which didn't qualify for the poverty income guidelines. So that was, again, a struggle. Um, but eventually we were accepted to a state funded preschool. And so that was great, but then they check your income every year. So at the time I qualified, but at the end of the year, I didn't. So again, it, you know, it was a constant, are we going to be okay this year? Um, and so then that happened and then I became a single mother and I had an infant and a toddler and a single mother. And, um, I was able to then qualify for Head Start. Um, and my children got accepted. So luckily that that really helped. But even then I had to um, accommodate for when my children were sick, right? Like, how am I gonna go to work? I had to call out sick when my children were sick, um, being a single mother trying to navigate that space. And so I'm so grateful for Head Start and all of their commitment to our children. And um, I actually work for Head Start now. So I know, you know the challenges our parents are facing with these scenarios, especially during the pandemic. And now as my children are older, I still face child care issues, right? Um, because the after school program, there was a wait list. So my children go in at nine o'clock, okay? I have to be at work at eight. Seven and 10 year olds cannot be left alone. So um, luckily I am married and my husband really does contribute to the household. And so we play as a team, but he travels for work. So it's something we're still juggling. We finally were accepted into the after school program, but then again, that's that's an additional six hundred dollars a month, right? That we're that we're taking into consideration. Um, so th there's all these journeys of childcare from infant right to uh, teens, because even as they're growing, they're still wait lists. We still have to apply, and I will tell you that after school programs during the pandemic 
were non-existent. So um, luckily I was able to work from home, but then I had to juggle remote work plus remote school, which was awful. And I probably lacked more so in the teaching or you know helping my, my children because I was more focused on being a provider and bringing in financial contributions to our household, right? So that was also a juggle. Luckily, um, there was a COVID relief through the YMCA at that time. And I qualified because, you know, now being in a uh, two, you know, working family, then we didn't qualify for services again. Um, but I know you mentioned like, what was the struggles, you know, what, what does that mean economically for our household? And it means sacrificing, can my daughter do competitive dance at this time? Because we have to sacrifice, you know, paying $600, all of the extracurricular activities. And then, you know, I can think of the beginning where we were looking to purchase a home. That income to debt ratio matters when I'm paying, you know, $1,200 when they were in the preschool system. Um, so when we got into Head Start, it actually opened up opportunity because I didn't have to pay that much anymore. But those are things that lenders look at. What does your child care look like? How much are you paying? So that can really make a difference into what I'm paying for my mortgage, the area that I'm living in. So it really just affects the whole household and our quality of living. Yeah, Grace, um, thank you for sharing your story as well. Uh, I can't imagine how how difficult it is to share, right? Like we... We have the solidarity, especially during COVID. I think those of us who were, as you both mentioned, fortunate enough to telecommute or work from home, um, our colleagues got a glimpse into our hectic lives, right? Our, some people had cats over their shoulder. Uh, we had kids sometimes over our shoulders. Um, and it gave maybe people a little bit more sympathy and compassion, but at the same time, these are issues that we have to deal with and it's it can be hard to talk about them even though I think there is a little bit more, at least knowledge about them today. So I heard both of you talk and touch on different issues, right? That affect um, the ability of, of mothers, of parents to participate. One of those was affordability. So you both mentioned that um, availability, right? And most places there's a childcare desert, meaning that there's not enough spots um, for the the kids that are in that area. And so, uh, you know, Grace, you were talking about how you had to juggle um, babysitters and other people, if they're fortunate to live by good friends or family, they may be able to squeeze something together. Um, I know I had to do that with my second child um, because she didn't have a daycare spot for six months after I needed it. So there was a lot of juggling. Um, and Grace, you use that word a lot as well. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to mention was hours. Aaron, you talked about how uh, you were considering working late, right? Um, I think, Grace, you, you might have mentioned that too. And both of you were either out of the labor force for a short time or were thinking about potentially, is it are the trade-offs worth it, right? Maybe financially speaking, maybe in terms of um, just balance in your lives and hours. So can you maybe both touch on that a little bit more uh, in terms of... Um, just the challenges that you've you've seen and what childcare has allowed you and maybe people you've interacted with or spoken with, what has it allowed them to do in terms of being in that workforce? And let's go with let's go with Grace first. Okay, so yeah, you know, in my position now, and I think throughout my whole career, I've always been expected to work some weekends. I actually am fortunate that I've been in the early education space and I, I did that with an intention um, because of my children. And even that, you know, I had to make decisions because of the cost or the pay for early educators or individuals in the space isn't always the living wage, especially in San Diego. So weekends and evenings were required when we uh, for outreach and events. And so that's always been a struggle. And that's, you know, working with my partner, my husband at the time, or making sure grandma or grandpa can help because the child care system is typically, you know, six to six or nine to five. Um, so it's not realistic for parents who have flexible schedules in their career. And I tried to have on-call babysitters, but that doesn't always work. And then to mention about the cost, it's, it's an additional cost to what I'm already paying in child care, right? Um, weekends, I've had to call in sick or bring my child, to be honest. And luckily I'm, I'm in a role where my kids enjoy the events we have, but they don't wanna be there for six hours. And it's a struggle to do my job well while I have my child with me. So I, I would say that it's definitely a struggle. And again, when I think of Head Start, 
although it was a great help for our, for our family. And the, you know, I was a Head Start alumni, so I, I love what Head Start is all about, but the hours were just not realistic for my work. Um, you know, they typically were done by four or five, and I, I was done with work by four or five. So how was I expected to pick up my child on time? So um, I think that has been a big, big, I still struggle, to be honest with you, because my kids are still kids, and I still work some evenings and weekends. But I, I have to have a system in place with my family, with my friends, and um, you, you, I have to respect that they also have lives. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, so one of the other uh, webinars that I've been on the past couple of years on childcare, one of the things that struck me most was someone saying that everywhere in the U.S. is a childcare desert after 6 p.m. I mean, so that makes that so difficult, right? If you're doing weekend work or if you're doing any kind of work after six o'clock that you need to get done. Um, and, you know, Grace, you said your your kids are a little bit older now. Erin, you're right in the thick of things like I am. So how does how does it affect you, um, you know, if you you can't, you know, the affordability challenges, the availability challenges, whatever uh, in that question you'd like to respond to? Well, I think, um, you know, the affordability challenge is part of it and the juggling that Grace was talking about, you know, it's, it's an emotional and it's a stressful and it's a big burden on families as well to have to be able to navigate um, even just day to day. Um, I mean, I not, I haven't been in the private daycare situation in a while, but at Head Start, there would be, we'd find out at 6am that the class is closed at 7am. Um, so how do we, we handle that? How do we navigate that? Um, and my husband and I have been a great partnership with, oh, I'll take this morning off and then you can go in the afternoon. Um, our family structure is not as strong locally, but we do have, you know, some people that we can rely on to pick up and assist with childcare. But waking up to that message in the morning and just having your whole day flipped around affects your, the mother, affects the matriarch, affects the patriarch, affects the entire family. The kids are like, oh, we're not awake yet. Like their whole morning is thrown off. So it's, it's also very stressful for families. Um, and we have families in our programs where, you know, the parents work all night long and they come and they drop off their kid and then they go home and that's their time to sleep. But, you know, their kid spilled milk all over themselves and they didn't bring an extra backpack. So now somebody has to come pick up that kid and the parent is sleeping and it's every day is a different challenge. Um, and I think that that comes a lot too from, you know, the extreme teacher shortage that we're experiencing, which is why I'm on the path that I'm on now is to get into the classroom to, to start giving these communities and these families and these children the support that they really need. Um, so that's kind of, it's just, it's so much more than just the financial strain. It's so much more than the scheduling. Um, it's, it's a lot of the emotions and the stress that, that these families are experiencing post COVID. Yeah, and I think um, we'll touch on some of those connections too in terms of teacher shortage in the next panel as well. Um, but you you both have that experience kind of on both sides too, right? Um, as I said, kind of in our, our pre-call, we're not just one, we don't just wear one hat, right? We're moms, we wear so many different hats and try to juggle so many things. Uh, and oftentimes there is spilled milk, uh, I'm very familiar with that. So um, I also wanted to talk about just how the funding, right, and the hours seem outdated. Um, and so when Ben was showing that slide on K through 12 per student funding versus infant and versus younger kids, um, it really struck me that it's just not, not um, conducive to the work schedules and the family structures that we have now, right? Most people, most parents in a two-parent household, both of them work now. So it's just unrealistic to think that you know, one parent uh, is going to be able to to pay the bills for everyone and have that financial stability. Um, and I know we're, we're a little bit short on time. So I also wanted to talk, since both of you are, you know, in Head Start and are in this, in this um, field, I wanted to get your perspective on solutions and what you think would really work for you as a parent or for what you're seeing others as parents, what work, what would work for them? If you could pinpoint one or two things that, you know, either businesses could do, the government can do, uh, families could do, providers could do, what might that be? And I'll start with Aaron this time. Um, uh, uh, the Los Angeles County Office of Education has a program um, through the heads through Head Start that's recruiting parents. They are saying, "Here's an opportunity for you to enroll in this program at no cost, and at the end of it, in a year, you will be an assistant teacher. You will have a job. Um, you'll have the accessibility to to maybe." Um, 
uh, another program that your child could enroll in. Um, and, you know, similar hours to what your, your children are, are needing as well. Um, that's really what kind of, I was in that transition of like, well, I need a job. What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And I was like, I've always wanted to be a teacher. Um, I grew up with the father as a teacher and I've just been recently inspired. And I said, this is where I want to go. And the opportunity literally fell into my lap and I grabbed it and we did coursework for, um, for credits. We are now doing our, uh, in classroom hours and we'll be hired in the fall. So, um, it's a really great program. And if anyone can, can get into the classroom and wants to be a teacher, be a teacher. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's really excellent. And um, I applaud you for taking that. I think moms are so tenacious and right. They're like, they're, they'll go after some opportunity, especially if it's going to be good for them and their kids. So mm -hmm. thank you, Erin, for sharing. Thank you. Grace, what about you? Um, well, I, I love that program, Erin, and congratulations on starting. Um, I would say, you know, the cost for care is definitely a big thing. What can employers do is like, um, is there an employer reimbursement that maybe could, um, you know, come with some tax and incentives for an employer when we think about the cost for a private sector um, education because not everyone is eligible to um, go into Head Start or state funded preschool. Um, but the second piece with MAC is that we um, have 19 child development centers and we see the scares of early educators and um, we're having a hard time filling maybe positions, which means that the parents are not having even more access, you know, the access to childcare has even gotten worse through this pandemic and just the culture of our workforce today, right? And so what we're doing is we just launched a registered apprenticeship program with ESEPs along with Palomar Community College. And so this is paid on the job registered program where there are, an, where are individuals who are interested in becoming an associate teacher, which is with the associate teacher permit, would be doing on-job training that's paid at 18, 65 an hour to start through the two-year program. The uh, education piece with the LEA is also paid for. We've made easily accessible at our administrative office. So all the employees for our prime visits would come to our centralized location to get that education piece. Um, if full time, you would consider a Mackey, which is, you know, working for Mac, uh, gain all the benefits. And after that two year contract is over, you would have all the qualifications after the successful completion. And then you could apply for a permanent position, whether it's with Head Start or any other early educator. Um, I think it's our goal to create quality early educators for our community, not just for MAC, because we really do see this need, whether it's in the Head Start, the state funded degree or the private sector. That's wonderful. I'm so glad both of you ended with um, teachers because that's so critical. Um, so in work that uh, I've done with colleagues, we showed that there was an 11% drop in the workforce, the ECE workforce between 2020 and 2020, the end of 2021. And I imagine it's still down, right? So we really need programs like this that pull not just people into the labor force generally, but also into the ECE labor force. So appreciate both of your time. Happy early Mother's Day to both of you. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Savage, who's going to moderate uh, the panel too. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Anna. And thank you so much, Grace and Erin. It was great hearing from you both. And, you know, it was thank you for sharing your stories about challenges with access. And it's interesting that that being able to access a limited resource such as Head Start played a big role. And I love how you both ended with talking about some solutions on the supply side, because that's exactly where we're going for the second half of this conversation. Um, and I'm sure the, the um, briefs have been posted at this point, but the three efforts that we're going to talk about in the supply side section are detailed in the supply side brief. So you can learn more there. We're going to hopefully get at the tip of the iceberg today with this conversation. Um, but this, again, is something that I've done with this great ECE work group that, that I'm a part of. And, and I've been at the Boston Fed for 10 years, and I would say the majority of that time I've spent working on childcare. And again, just to echo what my colleagues have said, being responsive to what we've heard in our district as an issue. Um, and we've, so at the Boston Fed, we've interviewed mothers in Massachusetts about trade-offs they make when accessing childcare or their inability to access childcare. And we more recently surveyed parents across the region and we have some briefs that will that will leverage um, 
data from that survey um, in the coming year. So to get started with the next panel, um, we have um, Dr. Kimberly Krasnowski, who's going to talk about an effort at the state level, Rachel Spector, who will be talking about an effort at the county level, and Jen Roberts, who will be talking about an effort at the city level. So Dr. Um, Krasnowski has, in between the three of them, I just have to say they have over 65 years of experience in the ECE field. So um, Dr. Krasnowski, also Kim, has 20 years of experience in early learning. She's the executive director of early childhood of the Early Childhood Innovation Center at Delaware State University. At the county level, we have Rachel Spector with over 25 years of experience in the ECE field. Rachel's the director of programs at the Children's Trust overseeing early childhood and the Thrive by Five early learning quality improvement system, youth development after school and summer programming in their innovation fund. And with an effort at the city level, we have Jen Roberts with 20 years of experience in the ECE field. Jen is the CEO of Agenda for Children, an advocacy organization dedicated to improving the well-being of Louisiana's children. So thank you so much for joining us, Kim, Rachel, and Jen. Um, and if we could just to stick with this order of state, county, and city, just to hear from each of you about, maybe you could maybe spend two minutes or so talking about your efforts um, at your respective levels, and also what motivated them. Was there a, a problem um, that you were responding to? And is it something um, new, or is it creating more access to something that exists, if you could um, maybe speak to those. So if we could start with Kim um, to kick us off with um, the Early Childhood and Innovation Center work. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so at the Early Childhood Innovation Center at DSU, this is a unique partnership between the Governor's Office of Delaware, the Department of Education in Delaware, and of course, Delaware State University. So um, I'd be remiss if I said that this wasn't an idea that had been circulating around our state for a number of years. The pandemic really was the impetus of uh, ensuring that um, funds were being not only diverted to early care and education, but there was a major focus or a, a continuation of a focus um, that the pandemic really um, forcibly made people see that the work that uh, we all know to be very important and essential was actually essential or being referred to as essential. So um, the idea around the ECIC, as we call it, um, is innovative solutions to early childhood workforce uh, challenges. And uh, two of our big initiatives um, at the state of Delaware um, in this program is redesigning and implementing uh, an innovative, comprehensive statewide scholarship model for folks in the field to get uh, a CDA, a Child Development Associate credential, an associate's degree or bachelor's degree. And with that, a main focus on CDA, as it is the major gateway or can be a major gateway to build on a pathway for higher education. So we have, um, we're going to be rolling out starting in July, um, a robust, comprehensive, holistic CDA cohort model that really focuses on um, making sure people are going um, and completing this degree or insisting upon their success with various models and really thinking about what it's gonna take for people to engage in a cohort, what going to take for them to stay within that cohort and actually obtain that CDA at the end. So um, without getting too much into detail, because I know we have a, a time limit, um, when I talk about comprehensive and holistic services, we're talking about allotting stipends for people for child care, transportation, textbooks, other resources that they might need, um, and then having a facilitator and coach with them every bit of the way to keep them motivated, to keep them on track, to make sure they're aware of all of the, S, uh, all of the pieces that the CDA requires. Um, and then at the end, after working um, six months in our in the field in Delaware, we're able to reward them and recognize them with um, a stipend at the end of $1,000. Um, and that's just on our CDA cohort program. So um, the funding for this, like I said, is a unique partnership um, that really came out of COVID and through um, a partnership with the Department of Education, a continued partnership with the Department of Education, we've been able to really blend and braid funds that were going towards similar types of programs, but now in a different type of um, a way. Thank you so much for that, Kim. Rachel? Yeah, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So 
Um, I work at the Children's Trust. We are a local funding source established by a voter referendum um, in 2003. And so we partner with the community to advocate and fund strategic investments. So our early childhood work um, has changed over the years. We actually started the redesign of our QIS um, before the pandemic and launched and then found ourselves in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but what we really did is exactly um, what you said, Sarah, is we were interested in increasing um, access to what already existed in our community. We have different sorts of childcare issues. We don't have childcare deserts. Um, we actually have um, zero waiting list for our federal childcare subsidy right now um, because of many things that have happened during the pandemic and since the pandemic. Um, and so our approach is really um, based on a two, de two generational approach to um, helping families achieve economic self-sufficiency and really um, childcare obviously is a huge part of that to help um, families be able to go to work. So our approach is um, sort of three pronged. We go at it to support our childcare programs that already exist. Our main goal is that children can access high quality childcare experiences regardless of their zip code and in their own neighborhoods if that's where they like to go. So we have a we built out a very robust um, high quality high quality um, tiered payment differential. So we're directing funding directly into childcare program to support reinvestment into their program. While at the same time we developed our own salary supplement program to um, provide stipends or awards to teachers twice a year. This is based on their ongoing professional development, their competency in the classroom, as well as their longevity in the field. Um, and then our, our really, I guess, most innovative probably is our Families Forward program where we're providing these scholarships to families. So in Florida, we have the pandemic followed by, um, or I guess during the pandemic, we had the passing of the $15 minimum wage law. So our families are already earning too much in Miami-Dade County to qualify for federal child care subsidies. So our um, Families Forward program supports families with child care subsidies. Between that, these are families that are really between the 150 to 300 um, percent of the federal poverty level. We really tried to address some of the issues that the parents that we just um, spoke to heard. We, we offer the scholarship for two years. So every year you don't have to get kicked out of the program. We take families that are transitioning out of the federal child care subsidy program into our program just to support continuity of care. Um, and we're really trying to um, disrupt the cycle of poverty for families. Um, all of our work is for the most part in high poverty areas, which covers probably two thirds of Miami-Dade County. Um, and so um, those three combinations of, of supports is what we put together in this area. Thank you, Rachel and Jen. Hi, everyone. So it's interesting because in many ways, the work that New Orleans is doing is kind of a blending and combination of the work that's happening in Delaware and Miami. Um, so many of you may know that we recently, in April of 2022, passed also a voter referendum. We passed a property tax, which would be a $21 million investment in infant and toddler care here locally, which will, um, in the first year, uh, give about uh, 1,000 seats uh, for low-income children, so infant and toddlers. But because of some of the work that happens at the state level, it's actually eligible for a one-to-one -one state match. So that $20 million is actually a $40 million annual investment. And the term of the um, property tax is actually 20 years. And so we are able to now build a, a pretty long runway to building out some infrastructure to support low-income children as well as families. Through some of the work that we've been doing over the years in partnership with several community organizations, that is actually for the first, for the next five years, both involving provision of seats. So that is just direct um, contracted seat model. We partner with next year 42 child care centers. This is an expansion of an existing program that we currently operate with 20 programs. So we're about doubling in size. Um, but it's also invest about $6 million. Uh, of that 21, and then depending on the size of the state match, whatever that number is. So if it's 6 million, it could be up to, to 12 million. 
in both workforce as well as facilities. Um, that's one of our greater challenges is that even uh, if we've got, you know, $100 million tomorrow, we don't actually have the workforce prepared to enter those classrooms tomorrow, as was suggested by the first panel. And we also don't have the buildings. One of the reasons that we don't have the buildings is that we are much like Miami in a hurricane prone zone. And so we have both neighborhood blight as well as we are still in recovery from both Hurricane Katrina, which was now um, nearly 20 years ago, but we are also still recovering from Hurricane Ida, which is now almost two years ago. And so we have those challenges. Um, and so we've actually built into the millage for the first five years, a building of infrastructure um, that will support that. And so what we see as part of our program is, you know, we're building infrastructure in workforce, we're building infrastructure in facilities and space. And then as part of the SEAT program, we're also building um, families. Uh, so we provide the seats and we provide support to the teachers and uh, the directors themselves who are actually working in those programs. Because one of our biggest workforce challenges is not just the pipeline, which of course is a, is a big challenge, but we're losing about 60% of our workforce uh, every year. And so it's also about stopping the sieve of, of losing those individuals and really ensuring that once they're in, they are supported, they are paid, they are compensated adequately and appropriately, um, and that they have a career path that makes sense for them where they can actually grow and develop over time. Great, thank you, Jen. And these are all great, you know, big innovations. And it's so interesting that they've happened at these different levels of state, county, and city. Um, and I'd love to hear about you know, who was at the table for sort of designing what the effort was and what did that sort of buy-in process look like? It sounds like you all have this very firm grasp on some of the problems that you are responding to. So maybe that was, you know, that's a critical first step, but I'd love to hear from you all about this sort of design and, and just getting that buy-in to get these things off the ground. And maybe even what role do you think it Played to be doing it at the different levels because you you know doing something at a state level is much different than doing something at a city level. So um, at, maybe we'll go backwards this time, Jen. If you want to start, sure thing. So one of the things that I think has been the most effective about our model is that we have a public, private, and provider partnership model. And what that means is that our work um, has a real undergirding around transparency and public um, access to the work. So all of our decisions around who gets the seats, how much they're funded at, um, even the terms and the conditions of the CEA of which the, the, the aspect of the um, cooperative endeavor agreement with the city actually went through a public process, which is kind of our coordinating board for early care and education. Um, and so that work is staffed by my organization and in partnership with NOLA Public Schools, but it's actually led by a 20 person board, which is um, nearly 75% providers that each represent an individual funding stream. Um, so that means that, uh, you know, our public preschool providers have a seat, our Head Start providers have a seat, our early Head Start providers have a seat, and our families have a, um, multiple seats. And so what that meant for us is that even there are checkpoints um, along the way. And so they even, even in, with respect to our annual spending plan, um, I actually go to that board um, in addition to my own nonprofit board. And, and seek their approval in addition to the city council and the mayor's office. And so there are um, you know, recommendations that are being built in along the way. But I would argue that even as part of the millage process, we have made um, the values uh, you know, around transparency and accountability and partnership with our providers and families, I think tantamount. Um, you know, this work would not have happened if it had not been for our providers, because at its core, the providers and the child care providers who um, work day in and day out with our families were the ones who were on the streets with the teams, you know, getting the millage passed. And um, they are, in many ways, the sources of so much of the innovation that's been happening. And so for us, you know, who was at the table in many ways, like they were the table, um, and so we have tried to strike a real balance in ensuring that not only are their voices there, but they are really informing those processes at every step of the way. And they check us. You know, oftentimes we'll get phone calls like, hey, you, you, you didn't do that right, um, or you, you went too fast. And um, we, we try to make sure that if, if we're in the wrong, that, that we go back and, and we make sure that we, we, we make it right. Great. That's, that's really helpful to hear how informative they have been. Rachel? 
Yeah, our our story is a, is somewhat similar. We are also governed um, by a thirty three member board of directors, um, inclusive of you know our superintendent to elected officials, um, and it was really important to spend a lot of time with our board um, to educate them about not only the importance of early childhood. Everyone doesn't come from that space. Um, and really taking a look um, at the data in our community, over 50% of the children in Miami-Dade County are arriving at kindergarten not prepared to learn um, and not prepared for kindergarten. And so the, you know, using data, we also um, created a provider advisory committee. So I would say that our providers, as well as our families, have been probably one of the most um, significant contributors because, um, you know, we believe in elevating beneficiary voice. They're the recipients of, of the services. Um, of course, we brought in some national experts, some local experts. In our situation, we aren't government, so we can, you know, we have a little bit more flexibility. We are leveraging a lot of, um, for example, we're leveraging class assessments from our state um, from the Department of Early Learning. And so we work very closely with our local early learning coalition, our local United Way, and all my our county partners um, that are operate Head Start. So we we really have everyone at the table, either through our board or in other strategic partnerships. And we spent a few years really listening and looking at data to to make the decisions. And then of course I come back every year to our board, we report. Um, like Jen said, they check us. Um, we're consistently also learning and listening and um, revising, I guess, on the way. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Kim? Um, I would, uh, well, first of all, I, I would agree with both Rachel and Jen, having multiple voices and having uh, advisory committees and boards certainly are something that we um, are, are also dealing with over here in Delaware. But I don't know if I, I probably didn't mention this, but our program is brand new. Um, we are slated to begin July 1 um, and um, a, de a dedicated team of people arrived in February um, to start working on this. I had been hired um, actually this, this month, last year. So one years. So we've been building up to this. So advisory boards that reflect our community um, are definitely something that we are planning to do because of our unique partnership with um, with our, our government or our governor's office, our local Department of Education, and of course, Delaware State University. Um, we had to ensure that voices and representation was there. So um, I would say my answer would be we had to focus or we wanted to focus on that higher ed community because we knew that was a path way that already existed for the workforce, but um, for a variety of different reasons, the pathways weren't as seamless as um, they could have been. Um, and Delaware is in the process of um, increasing qualifications, adding more seats to state pre-K, adding more seats to infant toddler care. So it's really going through a really wonderful um, rebirth, if you will, uh, of prioritizing um, funding and making sure access to families are there. But to everyone's point here on this panel, and then the, the earlier one, um, if we don't have teachers and we don't have ECE professionals, it doesn't really matter if we have more seats. So our focus has been um, streamlining, looking at the higher ed pathways, looking at the higher ed connection, and being at Delaware State University was really important for this project, it being Delaware's only HBCU. And Delaware is very small. If you've never been there, you can go from the top to the bottom in less than three hours. And I'm probably being... Uh, <laughs> I'm probably being a little bit too um, generous, probably like two hours. So although we're a small state, so unlike New, uh, unlike Louisiana, unlike Florida, we are a small state, but being a small state has benefits and also has challenges because um, sometimes you cannot... Um, uh, get things up and running as quickly as you think you would. But on the other hand, because we're small, once things are up and running, they can filter and, and funnel pretty quickly. Um, so I would say at the table, we had to have, um, again, our funders, the governor's office, making sure they were there, but also being at DSU with that leadership um, has really given us innovative reins to do what we need for the workforce in Delaware. And the people of Delaware, the, the teachers, the assistant teachers, the directors, the people to Jen's uh, Point, who are doing this work day in and day out, um, they are excited and they will be at the table. So one last thing I wanted to share, the ECIC, we have, again, we're, we're just building this, you know, our website 
our website launches on Monday. Like this is a brand new project. Um, that's you know we're building the bridge while we're uh, flying the airplane or whatever that whatever that statement is. We're doing it all together at once. But we have designed uh, five C's that we are uh, dedicated to doing, and it includes community communication, collaboration culturally competent and compassion. And those are five things that we are implementing into all of our work and voices of the field and their lived experiences are definitely number one. Thank you so much for that, Kim. So we're running out of time because whenever you have a great conversation, time just flies. But I'd love to sort of end with, um, if we could go around and I'm gonna combine this question. I'd love to know, what has been sort of the biggest challenge to this work? I know, Kim, you just sort of got into it a bit, especially since um, you're at a much earlier stage of impl implementation, perhaps, but maybe the, the biggest challenge and biggest lesson learned, if, if we can just go around and, and try to speak to those, whoever wants to jump in. Jen's off mute, so how about Jen? <laughs> sure, I'll go. Um, I would say our biggest challenge has been um, we really had less than a year to plan for implementation of year one of um, a really, really ambitious endeavor. And so I think for us, we've been sprinting um, as fast as we can. And because we have values around uh, integrity and transparency and engagement with others and quality, um, those things are constantly at tension when we know that these are very real serious issues. And we cannot wait. Like families are waiting every single day, and we have 8,300 families who cannot wait for us to get it perfect. And so I think that for me, the biggest lesson I've had to also learn is that this can't be linear. Um, in so many ways, I would have loved to have put A before, you know, B and B before C and ensure that absolutely every single thing can be perfect. Um, and it can't because at the end of the day, I know that we have to make the best decisions we can and be decisive and ensure that on day one, families are gonna get the best opportunity that they possibly can. And um, I think I've had to, I think, evolve to be a little bit more comfortable with the risks that come with really big and bold ideas. I, I Thank would, you for that, Jen. I would second that about just taking risks. Um, I guess our, um, my, um, biggest challenge I think would be that we really did our planning pre-pandemic mostly um, and we didn't expect that and then we also didn't expect that even though the $15 minimum wage law was being um, you know a, raised a dollar each year over you know five years we didn't expect that from during year one like Target and Amazon and everyone would start paying $17 an hour so you know, that, of course, affected the workforce, and then it also affected families that no longer qualified for the federal child care subsidy. So we worked really fast to enroll families. We're very proud that we have over 1,200 families accepting our scholarships. However, we have over 2,200 families sitting on the wait list. So like Jen, I feel like we need to, you know, these are 2,200 families that are calling and really making very difficult decisions day to day, as we heard in the first panel. Um, and so I think, I guess, which leads to a lesson learned, we need to fundraise, we needed to plan to have more money. The Children's Trust generously invests um, almost $40 million annually into our early childhood um, interventions, but clearly we can't do it alone. Um, and so we are quickly ramping up and trying producing assets and materials and really trying to get the word out that we have many families in our community that are struggling. The high cost of living, the real estate market has exploded in Miami, so people can't afford to live. The housing costs are out of control. So, um, so that's sort of what, what our biggest challenge right now, what we're working on. Thank you. And Kim, maybe I'm sorry to just give you one okay. minute, but that's right. I got it. I'd say time, <laughs> time is our biggest challenge and time for us implementing a program. I agree with Jen. We can't let perfection get in the way of progress, um, but you want to do it right. And because people are counting on you to do this and time for uh, programs to hire folks who are educated and with stipends and whatnot to keep them retained and motivated. We're running out of time. To Rachel's point, people are saying, 
you people only pay me this, I'm going to go work at Target or Chick-fil-A um, where I'm making more. So it, the timing of it is what uh, challenges us is that people have wanted this program. They are excited about it. They see the light at the end of the tunnel, but they need something now. Um, and it'll take, it doesn't, you know, it takes a while to get a degree. It takes a shorter amount of time to get a credential, but it takes time. So we're just hoping that um, people will just be patient with us and engage in the program and see the benefits um, of coming through and actually building up their career journey with us. Kim, Rachel, and Jen, thank you so much for sharing with us. It sounds like a tremendous amount of heavy lifting and that is so informed by those that are most directly connected to this, providers and families. And um, it's just been great having you. So thank you so much. And I'm I would love to continue the conversation, but I'm going to hand it back over to Jenny Blizzard. Okay. Thanks so much, Sarah. And thanks to our panelists. Thanks to you for uh, being here today. But before we end the session, quickly, we have several small requests. You will receive a survey immediately after this event. So please uh, fill that out so we can continue to improve and bring you timely and relevant topics. We are also asking that you visit Fed Communities to access additional articles, resources, and data about community development across the Federal Reserve. You will actually be able to access the uh, articles that were mentioned um, by Ben and Anna during this presentation. And last but not least, please follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And also, one more thing, please mark your calendars for our next Connecting Community session, which will be on June 1st, 3 o'clock to 4.15 Eastern Standard Time. And we ask you to register for that program. Thanks again for joining Connecting Communities, and we hope you have a great rest of the afternoon. Mm -hmm.